All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me well? Yes, Sharon, I see Sharon and Glen Allen, Amy and Craig, Chris and Dillingham, I see Homer and Juno. Wonderful, and welcome to this uh, video conference. Uh, oh, just a couple of words before we get started. My name is Artem, and I'm uh, the technician, video conference and tech for the Alaska OWL project. Uh, thank you for making time and coming this wonderful morning. Uh, to show up and uh, you know to listen to this wonderful people. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, right now you seeing everybody in the split screen view, so it means you're seeing everybody. Uh, as soon as we're going to start a video conference, an actual presentation, I'm going to switch it to full screen. So which means you're gonna see just us, and we see the last library that spoke. So most likely it's going to be Juno. So if there are any questions. Uh, if you wave your hands, we wouldn't see it for a moment. So the way we're going to handle it is we're going to have questions and answers section. So Tinashe and Dennis are going to go with their presentation. And then at some point, I will switch it back to split screen and say, OK, are there any questions? But instead of jumping in, we're just going to call on each community at a time. We're going to say, OK, Craig, do you have any questions? And Craig will unmute their microphone and ask Juno, do you have any questions? And so on and so forth. So. Uh, Everybody's pretty knowledgeable uh, about it, uh, but I'm just going to ask you to keep your microphones muted, uh, just in general for uh, per uh, you know good good housekeeping purposes. Because little things like that. So there's my microphone on the table right here, and you know I'm listening to this presentation and I'm getting bored, uh -huh. and I'm sitting and I'm going like, and you can all hear me. Thumb in my thumb <laughs> on the table, and that gets very, very annoying for everybody. So that's why we're going to ask to keep your your microphones muted. So uh, before we get started, why don't we just do a little introduction? So unmute your microphone, introduce yourself, who you're from, which town, which city, which library, and maybe just say your name, and we will go from there. Okay, Juno, you are up first. So go ahead, unmute your mic, and just say hi. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hi. I'm Lydia. I'm we're, Anne. We're in Juno. Absolutely. All right. So thank you, Juno. Uh, who wants to go next? Uh, Homer. Hi. I'm uh, Donna Adderhold, and I have um, spent a little bit of time in Zimbabwe, so I'm very interested oh, in wow. hearing your talk. Thank you. Where were you in Zimbabwe? Uh, mostly around Kwangi National Park. Oh, oh up there. Park, yeah. Sure. All sure. right. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Glen Allen. Okay, hi. You unmute and say hi. Yes, we're unmuted. And uh, my name is Sharon Abels, and this is the Copper Valley Community Library. And we're pretty excited to hear your presentation this morning. So we have a few people here, maybe a few more might trickle in uh, through the hour, we are hoping. So, thank you very much. Terrific, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, okay. Craig, Amy, hello. Hi, this is Amy down in Craig. Nice to see you guys. Sorry you're getting all that snow. <laughs> nice to see you too. There yeah, she is, right up there. Okay. Okay, I'm kind of and blurry. Chris and Dillingham. Hi, I'm Christopher Marks of the Dillingham Public Library, where it is actually raining, not snowing. <laughs> it was raining. Wow. All right, so we're going to go and get started. I am going to adjust the shot and move the camera a little can bit I, over. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So one of the things that we had prepared, we were working on the concept of working with, um, like from, from Tanasha's village to an Alaskan village and the similarities. And we also run an orphan group, uh, uh, an orphan center in Zimbabwe. So um, since there's that, not that many people here, I'm wondering if there's a particular area that any of you or all of you are more interested in than the other that we could focus on, or if we should just go ahead with what we had planned. Um, how about the one with, how about that? Well, there's the one with the most people are okay, so, Diane, I think. OK, uh, Sharon, we'll not let go. Well, we would like you to continue with what you've prepared. I mean, we're okay. interested in listening to anything you have to say, 
And so, okay. you know, we would be kind of clueless as to how to okay. guide you. So, yeah, just what you prepared is great. Okay, all right, wonderful. So I'm switching it to full screen mode, and we're going to start. Up, yeah, up. All right. Yeah. There you go. Go. So, um, my name is Dennis Gabory, and I'm the founder of Zim Kids Orphan Trust in Zimbabwe. And I'm Tina Shabasa, the director of Zim Kids Orphan Trust in Zimbabwe. And uh, we, we have our history with Alaska. My wife was uh, a, a, a head of the journalism department at UAF back in 2003-2004, and she got a Fulbright and I ended up in Zimbabwe. Uh, that's where we, we ended up in Zimbabwe. She started teaching at their journalism, and then the two of us went there, and one thing led to the next. While she was teaching, I was started to do some work with uh, orphans there, and that's how Tanashi and I met. Um, to do a brief, just to give you a little background, we're going to do the same thing. Just to give you a little background, Zimbabwe was colonized by the British, and uh, the Europeans were built the cities in such a way that made it very comfortable for Europeans. So. If you looked at a city that was round, say it was like round like a pie, and you sliced it down the middle with two slices down the middle. Now the wind in Africa goes from east to west. So the eastern part of the city always got beautiful, nice, fresh air. And that's where all the Europeans settled. And they have gorgeous houses to this day. I mean, it's unbelievably gorgeous places. Then you've got the industrial area where the smokestack industries were. And then that's where, after that, was where the Africans lived. So the way the British set it up is that the Europeans got their fresh air, the industrial area blew the smoke over the African area. And to this day, the cities are set up similar ways. Now the, the Europeans have mostly left, and in their place have become economically segregated. So and that's the part of town. There's a lot more, there are, it's a mixture of people but uh, it's economically segregated. So the vast majority of people in the city that we work in is uh, on the African side of town, which tends to be a lot, well, tremendously poor area. Um, so that's just a brief, brief history of Zimbabwe. And now we've been under a dictatorship for 39 years. Robert Mugabe is 89 years old, and he's still running the country and won the last election. And it seemed the last election was fair and square. The opposition is very corrupt and uh, just as he is. And uh, uh, so we, he, but everybody figured, well, I might as well vote for him because it's the devil you know. So he, he won. Anyway, so we're here, and Tanash is going to do a presentation about his life and about what it was like to grow up in Zimbabwe, what it's like to be an orphan in Zimbabwe, and uh, just to give you an idea. So I'll turn it over to Tanashe. Thank you so much. Right. Um, as you can see on the map, uh, Zimbabwe is uh, on the map of Africa. Just on the map of Africa, like we're just uh, between Botswana, Mozambique, Zambia. At the southern end of Africa. The southern end of Africa. That's where we are, and it's quite a distance from Alaska. So that's all about the map. Okay, just keep going. Okay. You can, you can. Oh, I can. I yeah. Can. This is all new to us because we've never quite done this before either. So I hope you have a lot of patience. All right, and we can go here. Oh, there we go. Okay. There we go, uh, on a closer map where you can see where Zimbabwe is, and uh, there's not much more on that. Then uh, that's the map of Zimbabwe, and we are in, we, we live in Blawayo. As you can see, Blawayo just uh, below Matobo National Park in Gweru, just in between there. That's where we are. On the, on the bottom 
left side of the country? Um, and originally, in my rural area, I come from Chegu to just near Arai, where there is Zimbabwe. If you can see where there is Zimbabwe, there, just on top, there is Chegu. That's where I was born and I grew up. But now I live in Lawayo. And what tribe lives in Chegutu area? Right, in Chagutu area, like from, I would start from Kwekwe, from Kwekwe, just below Zimbabwe there, from Kwekwe going up, it's Mashona land, then from Gweru going down to where there is Gwanare Zhou National Park and Bait Bridge, just near where there is Limpopo River there, it's Matebele land. So people, they speak different languages. Down there, they speak Ndebele. And up there, we speak Shona in Mashona land. So the common language is English. And if you want to know how to say the Ndebele, you just have to say in, da, and then point to your belly, Ndebele. <laughs> and that's the second language. And that's the language most of our kids operate in, although most of them speak uh, two or three languages. Yeah, so it, so in, in basically in Zimbabwe, we speak uh, three main languages, which is Shona, Ndebele, and English. Then uh, we'll move on. Uh, this is the part of the, the rural area, like where most of the farmers live and the game park area. What, what, when, when you talk about rural area, in, in, in Zimbabwe, people who live in the city have a rural area they go to. Mm -hmm. So who owns that? I mean, how, how does one get rural area land? Yeah, you, when you go to the rural areas, there's a chief who is the main guy there where you go to see and you talk to him that you want a piece of land where you can build and do your farming. Then there, that's when you can get um, a piece of land. They will allocate, like depending on the uh, like how many family members you have so that you can have enough land for your family and relatives and who owns the land before you get it uh, is the, the the chief who owns the land and the area that like that area like the area would be for example if my area is like for my senior I'm Basa so that whole area will be under me, Basa. So it will be Basa village, and that's where I can uh, divide and say, okay, you can have your portion of land in my land. So that will be the area of Basa village as okay. a chief. And uh, we move on. And this is the Eastern Highlands where we have our biggest mountains in Zimbabwe. This is uh, Inyanga. In that whole area, there's Inyanga and Chimani, Chimani Mani. And, and if you'll see, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of rock outcropping. Well, Zimbabwe is on an enormous granite block. And you'll oftentimes, you'll drive through Zimbabwe and you'll see mounds the size of mountains that it looked like someone just cleaned off the top, and it's solid granite. Um, you'll see those yellow, that yellow patches are, are a form of like L, um, fungi, fungus that grows on the rocks. Um, in Zimbabwe, there's a tradition of Shona sculpture, and so a lot of people car, uh, take rock, not just granite, because there's a lot of different kinds, really wonderful colors, uh, orange, yellow, blue, green, you name it and um, they pull the rocks out of the ground and use them for carving. Um, okay, okay uh, we move on. So this is uh, Matopo National Parks, where there are animals, where live, uh, animals which live there, and you can go, there's a place where you can just go to view. It's quite beautiful there. You can see the trees and the rocks. There are rocks which are stand on top of each other, which is so beautiful. So many tourists, they go to see some of those. Then we move on. And uh, this is in Zambezi. 
uh, Zambezi is uh, on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia. And uh, this is one of the, they say, seven wonders of the world. This is our falls, which is called Victoria Falls. It's on the border as well of uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia. And there we have uh, animals as well, like uh, elephants, uh, zebras, um, antelopes, giraffes. Yeah, I don't know. Is it good? Yes, and as well as warthogs. And this is one of the roads to the rural areas where there's uh, one bus which goes there every day. So it's like uh, the bus leaves in the morning going to town, then it comes back at night, uh, in, at night like maybe around 5 p.m. So everyone from the village, if you want to go into town, you have to wait for the bus. So this is the kind of the bus. So this, this is our country road. So from the, that dead road, you will get into a third road, which will lead you to the main city. And uh, when you talk about rural areas, these are the homes which people build. Uh, they use mud. Uh, poles. They cut. They cut down trees like those straight trees, and that's how they build uh, the houses. And they use thatch as well. So most of it, they we don't in rural areas. We don't use strings. We we have special trees where you can get bark, and the bark you can pull out from the tree, and you can make you can make the string to tie the poles of the roof and the thatch to attach it all together you use the bark of the trees and so these are some of the villages and there's a division there where like for example i would say uh atum will be owning the other part as you can see where there are trees there there's a uh, kind of like a fence which is built there so so for example i would say on the left, on the right side, that will be my part. Then where there's those trees at the, at the right side. On my left, on my right side will be mine. Then on the left side will be Jenny's side. Then the other part where we can see animals will be Atom's village. So that's the kind of the setup of the villages there. And this, this is a close up of the houses. So with uh if we can focus on the first three houses there the main house there will be the bedroom for the father and mother then the smaller one to the right where there is a line of clothes that will be the kitchen and the on the left side that will be where the kids sleep and the kids they sleep on the floor so in these kind of rural areas we they don't have like cement floors it's just um, the soil. So what you do is you use a rama, is it a rama, rama. right? A rama, and you you pound the soil until it gets to be so nice and level. Then from the cow dung, you take it while it's still wet, and you mix it with some of the soil. That's what you use as the floor polish to make it neat and nice. Then there, there are women and kids. They are just sitting there, um, enjoying the afternoon. There is not much to do. Like when you wake up in the morning, uh, women and kids they go to the fields, and then after, yeah, so they would go to the fields from 5 a.m. until 11 a.m. So after that, they will be just chilling and relaxing. Then from 3 p.m., they will go back to the fields until like 5 p.m. Uh, this is a kind as well of um, a Zulu kind of cow, um, house. Like all of those paints they use, they take from trees. There are some trees and soil, so they mix up. Well, like you go to a certain tree, like there are special trees for that where you can cut and there will be liquids which come out from the tree. That's when you can mix with particular soil and 
you can come up with a nice color from there and they build uh, in a better way than other people like they put actually on that one they use more grass and they cut it short to make it look nice as it looks on the picture and this is a typical uh, house uh, so as I was saying that if you can see that's the peak of the house like from the interior um, that string is uh, they took that from the back of the tree the one I was talking about so this is where all the poles meet and then you can attach the poles and this is another kind as well of housing this is a Zulu kind of house these people you find them in in South Africa and uh, this is a woman working in the field so people uh, in villages, some of them they do, they can't afford to buy cattle. So in, in in a way of getting their food, they have to do farming. So they do it by hand. So they use walls where they'll be digging up the soil. And do the men field. work in the field? Yeah, men sometimes. Like if most of the men they live in town, so they'll be the ones who'll be finding money for seeds and fertilizers because we mostly use fertilizers and so women will be women and kids will stay in the rural areas and they will be the one who will be doing the farming and the father would come once a month um, bring the money for seed uh, like buy seeds and fertilizers then when the crop is ready you would come to pick up some of the food to take to town and if you are the rich people in the rural area, they use cattle for farming and this is how they do their farming. So they put two cows or you can add to four, four to six and there's a, the plow you use, but mostly it's used by women as well and kids. Just keep going. And uh, yeah, um, most of the kids are the ones who take care of the garden, like the vegetable garden. So that is that chomolia. So the kids are taking care of the garden there. Chomolia is like a staple food. It's kind of like kale. Uh, and it grows in long stalks. And then if you cut the stalks off after it's kind of withering out, it'll regrow. And so you get like three or four more plants out of one plant. Uh, and that's kind of a staple food. Yeah. And as well, uh, kids are the, the ones who water the garden. So that girl is 10 and she's coming from the well. Like there will be a well, mostly when they put a, when they put a garden, it, there's a river which will be nearby where they could go with buckets and collect water so they can water the garden. Young boys, they do um, heading sheep, goats, and cattle. So that's one of the boys heading sheep and cattle, uh, uh, sheep, cattle, and goats. So on that one, he's heading, he, he can't afford to uh, head cattle as well. So he decided to take sheep and goats. And, and remember that like we're talking about villages as opposed to city life because there are modern cities in Zimbabwe and modern kids and modern people and they go to school and they do all the things that kind of modern people do but at the same time there's a rural area where where the the traditional culture still exists and where people where kids a lot of our kids are orphans sometimes are picked up by a relative and just whisked off into the countryside to uh to do herding or whatever the adults want them to do so you're talking about two very different societies living side by side. So uh, in the rural areas, that's uh, on the picture, that's the mode of transport. They use a uh, scotch, uh, not, uh, it's called a scotch a cart. Scotch and cart. the reason it's called a scotch cart is the Scots who came there in the early uh, 1800s built these carts and they'd never existed in their, that part of the world before. And so 
people started calling them scotch carts. So it can be ox driven or donkey driven. So you can put two, two to four cows together on with the yoke and then they can pull that off. So they are carrying thatch to build another house. Maybe they will have like the family will be extending. So but they will be trying to build another house for, for a family member. And at places where there are no wells, they use bowls. So the bowls uh, you use, uh, they are hand pumps. So you will be pumping it. So maybe you can do 10 pumps before the water comes since uh, most of the places they are dry and the water table is very low. But that's one of the... And the children are the ones who pump the water. As you can see. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And uh, in rural areas, there's no electricity, so they use uh, firewood. So that girl is coming from the bush to find firewood to make a fire so she can cook. And as well, kids are the ones who take care of the little ones. So that girl is carrying a baby, so she's the one who does the babysitting. Uh, sometimes if the girl, the little kids are at school, uh, the mothers are the ones who take care of the, the more little ones. And that one is making uh, breakfast. So like what they do, they take uh, the maize grains and they use a mortar and pestle. So they'll be uh, crushing it into pieces. They'll boil with that. So they'll, that will be called semp and semp will be eaten uh, during the break time. And okay. and uh, this is our staple food. That's sadza and vegetables. And just to give you an idea, sadza, if you took corn and ground it into flour and then mixed it with hot water and just kept stirring and stirring and stirring, until you ended up with something that looked like that, that is very stiff, stiffer than mashed potatoes. And then you put it next to some cabbage with a lot of salt, and you picked up the, the, the sadza with your hand and grabbed a little bit of cabbage with it, and that's the staple food. And when I say staple, I mean that they eat that three meals a day. If they're, ha if they're lucky enough to have three meals, they will eat a watered-down version of that uh, for breakfast, and then if they're lucky enough to have lunch, they'll eat what you saw on that plate and for dinner as well. But most of our kids and most of the people we know have one or two, if, if they're lucky, two meals a day. Uh, and it's like, Tanashi, when was the first time that you had ice cream? Uh, when I was 20, that was in 2008. So it was 20, and, and so a lot of our kids have never had foods that you would consider normal everyday things that you've had all your lives they just don't have until they're well into adulthood. And uh, women, when they are on their leisure time, they make baskets which they can take to the city to sell so they can earn money for, like they need little money to use at their homes in, in rural areas, like to go to the grinding mill where they, you can get your corn crushed to milli mill. So that's some of the work they do on their leisure time. Right. Uh, schools of, in, in the rural areas, they are so poor that uh, some of the uh, kids, they, they will be sitting on the floors. And so those are, uh, these kids were in a class doing their, solving their math problems. And uh, we don't have smart boards in rural areas, so we use black chalk boards. So that's an example of the chalk boards we use. And people, they have some ceremonies they do, so they'll be dancing, um, traditional dances, and Mostly on these, they'll be celebrating a marriage or they'll be celebrating um, um, a, birth. A, yeah, a birth or um, a new king or, a, yeah. So that's how they celebrate. And, and, and it's not like you can walk down the street and see one of these guys wearing, <laughs> wearing pelts or whatever. I mean, you just don't. 
um, it's, it's, it's a special occasion where you'll see this because, again, we're talking about a modern country where uh, two kind of traditions live side by side. Um, so you don't see it that often. It's not very common. Then in rural areas, they are, the clinics are further apart, like they are far away. Yeah, okay, I wanted just oh. to explain this guy. So this guy is one of the traditional healers, and this is uh, what he uses to... What, what do you call Diagnose it? some to, to diag problems. Yes, or if there is, for example, witchcraft, a disease which is caused by witchcraft, and those kind of things. So if there's witchcraft, he can kind of uh, get the demons out of the people. Um, a lot of people will go for traditional traditional healers for a lot of different things. In fact, we had one of our, our boys um, had hemophilia, and when he cut, the father couldn't believe he wouldn't stop bleeding, so they took him traditional healer, and they mixed mule dung with herbs and corn and sadza, and they patched a wound that they cut in his arm, and thinking that that would cure his hemophilia, which of course it didn't do. Um, so people uh, tend to go to traditional healers first, and then eventually go to a, a Western medical doctor, if it's available, and if they can have, have the money. Um, okay, so uh, this could be uh, a clinic, or people will be going to, to vote. Like, if, if this one is used as a clinic, like, special people from the city, they can come with their cars with... Uh, equipment maybe to test people HIV and AIDS so they would group up at a school or a big, where there's a big building so that's one of the example of the school so that's what they do so they come and set up uh, their scales and other things and this one is uh, a hospital in town this is like one of the main hospitals this is like actually a, a gorgeous hospital but I've never seen one that looked that good. So think of that as the, 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 the best of the best hospitals ever, um, because all the rest look, look way worse than that. We've had kids who uh, have uh, AIDS or HIV, were born with that and have tuberculosis, are extremely sick. They end up on a mat on the floor uh, in hospitals where you have to go and get their medicine at a pharmacy. You have to go bring their food in and clean them up. Um, it's pretty, pretty tough. Since the country has collapsed economically, most of the good doctors and, and nurses have left the country. So uh, that, that picture was an example of a great, amazing hospital. And uh, this one now uh, in the city, like downtown, people from the western uh, suburbs, since in Zimbabwe there is no employment, so they earn some money by going into town and selling the fruits. So this is an example of what they, they do. So they grew up, they group up and they'll be selling different kinds. So this one, these ones, they are selling onions, uh, apples. You can see that. Go ahead. Yeah. A lot of our women, are the caregivers that we have in, at Humula, keep going, are, are, no, keep, keep going, just keep. Yeah. A lot of the women in our neighborhood sell tomatoes. So you've got a, a block with five women selling the same thing. And somehow they make a few pennies and somehow they make a living. I don't know how. And a lot of times we get the old rotten tomatoes and uh, make... And, and plant them to grow more tomatoes, but uh, go ahead. Yeah. You gotta quick speed this okay. up. Yeah, so this is uh, the city of Blawayo. This is uh, this is the best side of the, the town. And then uh, these are the western suburbs, and uh, that's where we are. Where the African side of the population lives. Yeah, and uh, this is where we got our land for Zim kids, and so these are some of our kids who were clearing the land, and this is the building process. We used a building, when, when we formed Zim kids, we wanted our kids to be able to learn a trade, so when we got the money to build a site, uh, we used it as a training opportunity, so all of our older kids uh, built the site, 
Uh, so they all were trained in, in every kind of aspect of building, including solar installations and so forth. Um, so I think, and, and one of the, the, the things about uh, Zim Kids, I, I think it's important that you, that you hear like Tanashi's personal story because it kind of gives you a framework. Our kids' lives are so, so absolutely opposite of American kids. Um, and so maybe if you heard just a little just bit of yours and then talk to about, us, see about, yeah, villages. You've got about what, how many minutes? Uh, we have about 20 minutes. Okay. okay. So just, uh, okay, just a short um, of uh, um, my life. Like uh, my parents separated when I was two years old and uh, my mother left, so I was left with my father. So my father would lock me and my sister, I have an older sister who's three years older than me. So I was two and my, my, my father would lock us in a room with uh, some food enough for the day. Then uh, uh, when I was three, my mother decided to come to pick us up and took us to the rural areas, to one of those homes I showed you. And uh, my grandmother had a little more children to take care of. so. She couldn't afford to take care of us, so she passed us to another relative, which is my aunt, who was taking care of us. And she had her kids as well, so we a little more problem to her. So she decided that she would, she should cure one of us to have less problems. So she put poison in my food, but lucky enough, I didn't die. But uh, I didn't get... From that time, I didn't get enough food, and I suffered a disease called Kwashioka, where you have a big belly, and you'll be skinny, and you have a big head. And a neighbor sent a message to my father that your kids are dying here, and my father came to pick me up and uh, took me to a hospital. So I took me three months to recover in a hospital. Then uh, it took me home where I was staying with my stepmother until I was 15. Then she decided that it's enough for me to go to school, so I should go to the farms and look for a job to be heading cattle, sheep, and goats. But that's not what I wanted. So I went to look for my mother, then I found my mother and um, asked her if she could help me. Then she said, the only thing I can help you with is to find a job for you at tobacco fields where I was spraying uh, pesticides and weeding uh, tobacco, trying to raise money to go back to school. But unfortunately, that couldn't happen because the money I was getting, I would give it to my mother to keep it for me. Then my mother would spend the money with uh, her boyfriend. So that couldn't work out so what the the, the storyline here is that so you've got you have a couple of babies then you desert them then you come back and take pick them up then you give them to one person who gives them to another person who gives them to another person and that's how our kids lives are they get traded from one to the other to the other to the other so how many how many younger mothers do you have there's a tradition of more multiple mothers so I, I have five mothers. She has five, he has five mothers. So think of like it's it's what happens in a society that's been many people have been killed by AIDS, is that you're missing this generation. So how do kids cope with that? Well, you cope with that by having a lot of different mothers, so that you can kind of go from to another mother in case this one dies. So you have a wide family, a wide family. But some of those mothers who may be aunts like they try to kill him, which which can be very common because she's got too much to cope with as it is. Um, so a lot of our kids experience the same kind of thing. And one of the things that we face is that a child who is not useful is a child who gets tends to get thrown away. So if you don't get up what do you what kind of chores would a typical child have to do yeah like you have to wake up early in the morning and clean up the floors and do the dishes then go fetch water that's maybe light a fire for your mother or whatever to to get that going and that's true in the cities as well um so kids have jobs and if they don't do their jobs uh is people get beaten yeah you can beat them up or you won't get food uh, for that day and, and there's also uh, the, the culture here, 
in the States is very child-centric. And in Zimbabwe, the culture is elder-centric. So everything is about the elders, not about the children. So if the child, like for instance, we'd have a whole, all of our kids are 200 orphans we take care of. And when every so often we'll have a party and we'll give everybody food, including the grandparents, grandmothers who are taking care of them. And a grandparent literally would walk by her granddaughter and reach down into her plate and take all the meat out of her plate, continue walking and eat her meat. And the child would do nothing. Not a word. It's absolutely normal. We had, we've had kids who come in with wounds this big around uh, and not complain, because if they complain, they might get beaten. So they come into us and we notice those things. We put a ba big bandage, we have the smallest bandages we have are two by four inches. And uh, once we bandage them up, we have to take them home and explain to them that what we did, because if they go home and someone notices that they've been treated, the family is embarrassed. So they might beat the child because we treated them. And they now, we now know that the child had, had a wound that hadn't been cared for. So children come last, way last, so totally different. So in Tanashi's case, he grew up, he was always last. And what's, what happened with him was after he was 15, he was determined to go to school. So he ended up in, in Bulawayo. And tell them a little bit, or just to no, just oh, he ended, I can do it faster. He ended up in Bulawayo, and his sister said, come on down, I'll put you in school. Well, they speak a different language. So now he has to go to school in a whole different language, but he manages to pass three of his courses out of five. And at that point, he started volunteering. So he turned his life and his life experience um, from lemons to lemonade, in a sense. He wanted to help kids who had been through many of the things, same things that he did. So cultural, culture-wise, it, it, it's so tar starkly different. And like when I go there, I'm there six months of the year. Uh, the only people to be afraid of are the authorities, not the people in general. Um, we just have lots of problems with getting stopped by the cops on the road for bribes and all kinds of things like that. We have... Um, um, what else can we say about the culture? The Council of Elders. Uh, we have, in Zin Kids, we have a Council of Elders. Normal villages have a Council of Elders where you go like a judicial court and you go to them to solve problems. At Zin Kids, we turn it on its head and we have a Council of Elders for our 15 to 18 year olds. And those elders run all of our activities. So we try to give them that kind of opportunity. Um, Question time. question time. All right, so if it is question time, I'm going to bring it back to the split screen mode so we can see everybody. And this way you guys can have uh, your turns asking questions. I have a couple questions from Glenn Allen. Um, the okay. first question that I have is I didn't hear any type of percentages of children um, of your, the population of your area, kids that, um, how many kids are affected by AIDS? And how, how what is the, I, I'm not quite sure if I'm asking well, this right. One out, of, one out, of, one out okay. of five kids are orphans. So one out of five kids is an orphan. Now in Zimbabwe, an orphan is defined as someone who's lost one parent. Generally speaking, it's the father who's died. Uh, so our orphans generally, have, are, all of our orphans have lost their fathers. Through Many AIDS. Through AIDS. And the rest of them have lost either, have, have also lost their mothers, but we have a lot of them that still have mothers who are still living, but are HIV positive. Um, we have about 25% of our kids are HIV positive, so they were born with HIV. Or if they weren't born with it, the mother had HIV and passed it on through breastfeeding. So HIV is endemic in the society. So uh, these, yeah. so these children are basically throwaway kids. I mean, it sounds to me like the family can do anything they want with them. They can poison them. They can die, and none of the authorities do anything about it. They try every so often. You might hear of a case where they'll do try to do something. 
But we had a little girl who was raped by her grandfather. He was in jail overnight and was sent, sent home. Nothing ever happened to him. We had a, a boy yeah, they let who, him out and they under their Right. They let him out with a bribe of $150. Then we had a boy who went to school and arrived late. And, of course, the teachers are allowed corporal punishment there. So he whacked the kid in the head, and he lost, he, he blew out his eardrum. He lost his hearing in that side of his, uh, uh, on his right side. Um, and nothing happened to the teacher. In fact, when I went to complain, they complained to me about how I was mistreating the teacher. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's not as, it's not like so stark and, it's it's not I don't know it's not like in, you can't think of it like in the movies where it's like horrifying, but there it becomes a normal thing. It's a, it's normal for our kids to get beaten. Um, you know, Tanasha when he didn't pass a test, they made him dig a hole a meter deep, and then they whipped him ten times, uh, and that's normal. Uh, and it's about to, when you get to extreme abnormality in our in our minds. You can't apply our moral values to what they're doing because somehow it, 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 you can't impose that because the side is obviously too big. I certainly can't by myself. Uh, but right. what we do as Zim kids is just give them the freedom to be, to find the spark inside themselves and be able to express it. You know, um, so we try to give them a, something like that. But boy, uh, it's a tough life. For the most part, like we have a girl who is uh, 18 years old who does our preschool program. She's 18 years old. She didn't pass her, her, her O levels because why? Her mother kept pulling her out of school six months, three months at a time, taking her to a rural area so she could take care of her mother's children while her mother went to South Africa to see her boyfriend. So the girl never got the education that you, you would expect her to get, but she's brilliant. And now she runs our preschool program at 18 years old. So we have situations like that. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Hi there. Um, boy, I have so many questions. <laughs> I, don't, okay. I, I don't think I can get to them all. Um, I'll just ask a couple that come to mind. One is actually more of a comment, I guess, than a question. Um, when I was spending time in Zimbabwe, it was quite frequent for women to be shocked that I had no children. And uh, so, you know, my take on that was that having children was a very highly valued thing. And uh, so I, I, that's, I guess, you yeah, can expand that, on that. That is, tr that is true. Like when one uh, get uh, like, for example, if I get married like today, they would be expecting in the next two months my wife to be pregnant. So if that doesn't happen, they would think there's a case or something happened. So you know, it's something expected that you have to have a kid. Like at my age, I'm 25, I'll be expected to have a child. But it, what's the oxym? It's kind of an oxymoronic kind of thing where you're expected and highly valued to have children. But then once you have them, you abuse them, right? That, that's your point, I think, right? Yeah. Which doesn't make any sense. Well, uh, again, you have to uh, kind of uh, twist your mind around an elder-centric society and take it to the same extreme that we have taken a child-centric society. Then it kind of makes sense. I think if you're able to do that with your in your mind, you you might be able to make sense of it, because uh, otherwise it really doesn't make any sense. You know, I mean, we've had we have a friend, uh, one of our boys who's uh, was had a got a snake bite in his leg, uh, lost his leg, at, six months down the line, and now is at university. Why? Because he was useless. He was a throwaway child once he lost his legs. So the family gave him to an aunt. Well, the aunt happened to know of a, hand, a school for the handicapped, which he ended up going to and getting an education. So his 21 siblings, who never went past third or fourth or fifth grade, never got an education because he lost a leg. And he was sent to 
a relative who might have known about a school with a handicap ended up now studying in the States and he's working on cloning. You know, I mean, crazy stuff like that happens at the same time. The, the other question I have, and when I, the last time I was in Zimbabwe was, um, I think I left in early 2006. And um, I had spent about five months there. Um, I can't remember what the economy was doing at the time, but, um, you know, it was not very good. And, of course, you know, inflation was rampant at the time. And I, I just can't even imagine what it is now and, you know, the, you know what's happened with the, the official uh, rate and the... Um, uh, uh, and and the black market rate for changing money. Um, uh, uh, all right. I'll, I'll and I have, and, and I just have the a, cost of a loaf of bread. <laughs> well, I have a, a the the currency in Zimbabwe today is the U.S. dollar. It's not the Zimbabwean currency, okay? And um, I have in my hand one of the final notes before the currency completely collapsed and they switched to U.S. currency. And this note is for $50 trillion. That's trillion. So you go to the, to the, um, uh, the store and buy a dozen eggs for $50 trillion. It was crazy. The economy collapsed because of the government's uh, taking over all the farms, which was the backbone of the economy. And um, so uh, they, we don't have that problem anymore. We have prices now that really reflect the same prices as they are in America. But imagine trying to live in America on $150 a month, because that's what most people make. So it's pretty bad. And a lot of the companies are now closing down because the government wants to uh, indigenize the companies. So at 51%, of the, they want to take 51% of all foreign-owned companies, even, even international banks. So a lot of them are just leaving the country right now. Yeah, it's bad. Anything I'd, else? I'd like to know how to, how to get in touch with you guys after this presentation. You can go on, uh, actually, if you go to zimkids.com, that's Z -I -M -Z -I -M -K -I -D -S dot com. And you can look at our website there. And if you want to email either one of us, it's Dennis with two N's at zimkids.com or Tanashe, that's T I N A S H E, at zimkids.com. And we will get your email and then we can get stay in touch. Oftentimes, we like to do. Skype video conferences from with our kids to kids here. Um, so we do them around the country. We have schools around the country that we're associated with that uh, we try to, in, you know, enlighten the kids in America about what our kids' lives are like and show our kids um, a little peek at the life that we're able to leave here just by accident of birth. So feel free, please give us a, a drop us a line and and we'll stay in touch and we can do those kinds of things. Uh, can you talk a little bit about ZimKids so they just know what So it is? so just to give you a little background on ZimKids, so once I went to Zimbabwe, I started uh, we started very very gradually. It's a very it, the organization today is one which is built by our kids, run by our kids, for our kids. Now we have two staff members who are not orphans. That's Janasha and Philip. The rest of them are our kids who have been with us since they were 10 or 11 years old. And now they're 20 years old. And they uh, are 18, 20. And they are uh, now our staff. What we've done is we, we saw that the kids were powerless in their communities. So we wanted to give them something that they could have a say over. So that's why we uh, organized a Council of Elders. Well, once our elders grew up, other ones were coming up behind them to take their place, so the elders became senior citizens. The senior citizens, who are now 18 to 20, were the ones who helped build our center. And if you go on our website, 
you can click on the video there and it will you can see a video of the center that we built. So those seniors and and Tanaji and a couple of others built the center. Once we built the center, then we staffed it with our kids. So the seniors grew up and they became staff members. So we've got uh, a girl who's been trained to be a counselor. Uh, Samantha's uh, doing early childhood education training and running our preschool. We've got uh, Foster and Colin who are our solar experts and did all of our electric throughout the center, installed solar panels so that we're entirely solely solar operated. Um, we've got uh, Washi who bans our library. Now all of those people will eventually move out and into regular jobs so that the the present elders would become seniors and engage in more vocational training and then become staff members and then become uh, then go out on their own. So that's the way we kind of work is we try to keep the, the leadership of, uh, opportunities for the younger kids coming so that the older ones keep moving out. Uh, we started very small uh, you know, it was, it wasn't my intent, it wasn't, we had no strategic plan. I may have a business degree, but I never, I don't believe in strategic plans in this kind of thing. I believe in letting something evolve naturally. And if it just takes you where, if you follow where it wants you to go, you end up in a good, a better place than if you had planned to go there. At least that's the way I tend to work. That's the way Tanasha tends to work. And we try to work within a culture, which is, can be very difficult, um, dealing with police and corruption and all those things. You have to kind of wiggle around through a lot of different, crazy, a lot of craziness uh, to get to where you want to be. Um, and I think for us, it was we wanted to provide some an opportunity for our kids, but we also wanted we wanted the kids to have to make a memory, make a happy memory. Uh, learn as many vocational skills that they can learn so that maybe one will stick and they can get a job because most kids get out and they can't get jobs and they just get pregnant or they get into crime and so you want to provide them with something for a future. So that's basically what Zimkins does and we do it um, uh, on a very shoestring budget. We don't, our money, there's no money spent in the United States that's raised by Zimkins, all spent directly on our kids. Um, uh, so, uh, someone wanted to say something? Yeah, the one who's standing there. The one who's standing there. Ooh, yeah, I did. Wanna, yeah, we okay. did want to say something, but you answered our question. Our question was, oh. how would we help empower the kids? If we sent money, would it be taken away from them? You know, but you answered that question. Yeah, so yeah, see, a lot of people want to give an individual child money, and we don't do that. Uh, so you go, you can go to Global Giving, and you can donate through that, through there. If you wanted to designate it for a particular kind of use, you can do that. What we do is, you know, we really we feed our kids, we train our kids in, in vocational programs. Like we have girl welding team, we we that we are forming eventually into a girl welding company. We have the, the solar guys who are teaching other kids how to do solar and install solar panels and solar hot water heaters. We have um, our sewing program, which we're starting this year, um, courtesy of a little old lady in Dallas, Texas, who's giving us all these sewing machines. Um, uh, so we have, and then we have our computer training program, and we want to give them all of that, and at the same time, build their business skills by training them in how to run a business. So, so we're doing all of that, and so any funds that we get through, say, global giving, one is tax deductible, and two uh, goes directly to aid those kids. Um, like I say, unlike other operations, we don't have we have two staff members. Uh, I'm all volunteer. I don't get any money out of this. All of our money goes there. If anybody wants to see our books, they're more than happy to look at them. Um, and we have receipts for everything, so everything is covered. Um, and and so anyway, that's where we are. Yes. So you don't have to grease the wheels with the authorities. You don't have to give them oh. money to be able to oh. exist. Oh yeah. 
Okay. No, we do. We do have to. Um, okay. And when when I have to grease the wheels, like, well, it depends. Sometimes, sometimes we have three three things we have to deal with. If there's a white person problem, a Shona person problem, or an Indabelli person problem. So if we have a Shona who can go and deal with the Shona problem. The white guy can go deal with the white problem, and the Indabelli guy can go deal with the Indabelli problem. Sometimes the greasing the wheels means 10 bucks here, 20 bucks there, a beer, um, you, you know, things like that. When they get to be hundreds of dollars, then we, we don't go there. Um, that's part, you have, to, you have to factor that in to what you're doing. But as time goes on, now that we've gotten more and more credibility in the local community, and the fact that Tanache has made friends with the different flavors of, of police they have there, because there's lots of different departments. And yeah, because we, we, have, we have discovered that these guys, if you keep on greasing them, they'll always come up to you creating more problems and more problems. So at least you have to kind of manage what you're doing with them. and. So that's when I decided to be friends with them so that I'll say, okay, I'm your friend, so why are you doing this, you know, and things can work out from there. And he's done such a good job that some of the police came to the airport to see him off when he came to the States this time. So, <laughs> so that's reducing our problems in that area. But it still doesn't stop the problem that I have, like when we leave our house in the morning, you inevitably will get stopped, and they'll try to find something wrong, and they want ten bucks. I mean, that, and that happens to everybody. But peculiar to our organization, we really don't have a problem at this point. All right, we have about four minutes left for the conference. Is there any other questions from anybody? It looks like there is not. So. Any closing words? Um, yeah, all I wanted to say is thank you so much, guys. It was so nice talking to you. I'm so happy. Um, you know, if we can do this again, maybe when uh, Tanashi and I are going to be back in Zimbabwe in December 1st. And again, if you'd like to do it with our kids, uh, we'd be happy to set something like that up. Our team is going to make it possible for us to use the same system that you've got here. And so if you want to do that at some point, we'd be happy to do it. Uh, and then we could even give you a tour of the center, a virtual tour of our center. Um, walk around with our computer and just show you around, and you can meet some of the kids if you'd like. Um, uh, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Again, please feel free to contact us. It's Dennis at Zimkids.com or Tanasha. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah.